Welcome to another UCLA Connections virtual conversation meant to build community and foster resilience during COVID-19. Professors Andrea Gez and Jennifer Doudna are world-class scientists who represent the best of science. I'm delighted to moderate a conversation with them. Professor Gez won a Nobel Prize in Physics on October 6th. And the very next morning, Professor Doudna won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, both richly deserved. Welcome, Professor Gez and Professor Doudna. Dr. Doudna, I'd like to start with you. You won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for your development of CRISPR-Cas9, a powerful genome editing breakthrough that has revolutionized medicine and biology. CRISPR allows scientists to rewrite DNA in any organism including human cells with remarkable precision. Your research started though as curiosity-driven fundamental research. Can you walk us through how CRISPR evolved from your early research into such a profound breakthrough in genomics that can edit human DNA and improve human life? Well, good morning, Dr. Carter. And it's a real honor to be here with you and, and with uh, Dr. Gez. It's, uh, it's really exciting to be able to talk about our science uh, with all of, all of the folks that are attending today. And in answer to your question, you're absolutely right that our, our research on CRISPR started as a curiosity-driven project to understand how bacteria fight viral infection. And they do it uh, with different, uh, different tools, but one of them is something called CRISPR, which is actually an immune system in bacteria that allows these uh, microbes to acquire immunity to, to viruses in real time and destroy viruses that have a genetic code that matches the, the code that the bacteria has uh, made a memory of. So we studied the molecules involved in the CRISPR pathway and in the course of doing that work with our collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, with whom I, all, I shared the, the chemistry Nobel Prize this year, we figured out that CRISPR molecules could be used as tools for genome editing, for ways to, that scientists could accurately change the DNA in cells or organisms using this uh, what started as a bacterial immune system. And so that was really the origins of the CRISPR technology. That's great. I know that your research has focused on RNA and its structure and function. Can you describe how you first became interested in RNA and, and how did CRISPR emerge from this research? Well, going back to graduate school, I got interested in RNA because I was fascinated by a question that my graduate advisor, Jack Shostak, was working on, which was, uh, you know, where did life come from? And it's a question that has puzzled human beings probably ever since there were human beings. And we've wondered, you know, how, how, did, we, how did we get here? How does, how do, why does biology evolve and look the way it does on a molecular level? And so part of the key to that understanding is the discovery that molecules of RNA, which are, I would call them uh, DNA's chemical cousin, are quite ancient on the planet Earth, and there's a lot of evidence that these molecules have the ability to both encode genetic information, but also to carry out chemical reactions. And because of that, many scientists think that RNA was uh, kind of the, you know, the, the primordial molecule, if you will, uh, at least here on Earth. And so I've been, I've been uh, interested in this question in different you know, different facets of it for my whole career. And so we got interested in the role of RNA molecules in the CRISPR immune system. And in fact, that's how I got, I started working on CRISPR in the first place was to understand how RNA is used as the recording and detecting mechanism in that pathway. Terrific, thank you. I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Gez into the conversation. And, you know, Andrea, you helped pioneer a powerful technology called adaptive optics, which corrects the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere in real time and opened the center of our galaxy as a laboratory for exploring black holes and their fundamental role in the evolution of the universe. With adaptive optics at the WM Keck Observatory in Hawaii, you and your research team answered one of astronomy's most important questions, working to show that a supermassive black hole resides at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. 
Can you walk us briefly through this remarkable research journey? <laughs> um, well, thanks so much, Emily. It's a delight to be in this conversation with you and Jennifer. Um, it's been quite a journey. It started um, uh, in the form of this precise experiment 25 years ago, um, or 26 years ago, actually, when I first joined the faculty at UCLA. Um, and I was, I had come to UCLA in order to get to access to um, the Keck Observatory. So Keck is co-owned by the University of California and Caltech. So in order to get access, ac you know, being at these institutions was critical. So I was really looking for, it's kind of ironic actually, when you think about this, I was looking for a good question to get me tenure. <laughs> um, and, um, it was building off of my long-term interest in black holes, but we were really just at the right moment for asking this question, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy as a way of proving that these really large black holes exist in the universe. So um, in the beginning, it was all about developing ways of getting to the diffraction limit to the highest resolution possible of these really large telescopes. Um, and over the 25 years that we've been doing this project, the technology has evolved tremendously. So we started off with a very simple approach. So I often call this poor man's adaptive optics because it was hardware simple. Uh, oh, poor software. woman's adaptive. Oh, sorry, poor woman's adaptive optics, that's right. Um, and we started off with something that was um, hardware and expense wise simple, but computationally complex. Um, and uh, we thought we would do this project for three years. And the objective was to be able to discover stars that were as close to the heart of the galaxy as possible. And the reason that's so essential is that you, you probe the presence of a, of a black hole by um, watching how stars uh, move. So you first have to prove that your technique works. You have to hope that there are actually stars that are close <laughs> enough that um, it you know, sort of hits the, the, the perfect uh, uh, place where, where they actually show motion. Um, and we thought we would do an ex experiment that was only gonna be three years long. Um, so in fact, the thinking, and I think this was really reflective of the skepticism that the technology would work. Um, and in fact, our first proposal was turned down. So um, that skepticism uh, was indeed there. So we had to prove that the technology worked, that we would see stars and that um, you could see them move. And um, what we quickly realized um, once we got going was that this was gonna be far better and far more exciting than anybody had even dreamed of. I mean, um, what we're doing today is far beyond um, the original inception of the work. So not only can we see them move in little line segments, but we realized that the orbital orbits of these stars were um, short enough to be um, to measure them on a reasonable time scale. And you know, for context, it's useful to think about the sun that takes 200 million years to go around the center of the galaxy. You know, no one's going to talk about measuring the orbit of the sun, um, but these stars, um, in the end, um, have orbits that are as short as um, 16 years. Um, and that's what has enabled us to go from a three-year project to um, a much longer project that has much more ambitious goals. So um, we've moved the case for a supermassive black hole um, from a possibility to a certainty by increasing the evidence by a factor of 10 million. So the three-year experiment kind of got you a factor of a thousand, which is already pretty amazing in itself, but didn't reduce the skepticism. In other words, people still had doubts. So um, being able to get to the next phases where you could get complete orbits and confine the mass to a much smaller volume was essential. Um, and then there's just been so many questions that have come out of this. It's, it's, been, it's been a really exciting journey. That's great. I mean, you clearly are greatly increasing our overall understanding of the universe. And I wonder, you mentioned already, and I wonder if you could just say a word or two about how you first became interested in black holes. Oh, you know, it's so these questions about how we first get interested are so um, are, are are interesting because hindsight's twenty twenty. We can tell a narrative that makes sense, but along the way, it, it isn't as clear um, to us. And um, I think that's that's super important and uh, to recognize because we can tell these stories where it's so clear that um, 
we got interested early. So I certainly got interested um, in questions of the universe and space and time in the early, from the early moon landing. So I think I was four when that happened. Um, of course, there are a lot of things that happened between then and going to college. But by the time I, um, I hit college, black, um, black holes really fascinated me. Because if you think about um, these or the questions that were really um, exciting to me or, or puzzling and kept me up at night, which is, what is the scale of the universe? What do you mean about the beginning, the end of time? This really bothered me. <laughs> Um, and black holes have the same characteristic in terms of um, if you use the, the, the laws of physics that we experience in our everyday life here on earth, you, you just can't understand these questions. And to me, black holes really represented um, that breakdown. So I think ever since college, I've been really cleanly or clearly interested in um, the journey to understand black holes. That's great. So I'd like to ask both of you to discuss the importance of persistence and creativity in achieving world-class research results. We all know it, it, it's a long journey. So maybe, um, Jennifer, I could start with you. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question because I think, I think about this a lot. I think about this every day, in fact, because um, one has to, has to face uh, you know, the struggles that come along with doing science. It's, uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's easy to kind of misunderstand the scientific process maybe when you, when you hear about a Nobel Prize winning discovery and it makes it sound as though it all just, you know, fell, all the pieces kind of fell into place automatically. And as, um, as Andrea just said, you know, the, the truth is, is usually a lot more complicated, a lot more interesting, but you know, it does, does require a lot of perseverance and, and frankly, um, you know, kind of just trusting one's, for lack of a better word, kind of instincts about what's, what's going to be interesting to pursue because when, none of us really know where our research is going. That's why it's research. And so, uh, you know, we have to sort of, um, you know, decide what we're passionate about. And I loved your, your story about being passionate about black holes, Andrea, that's just, that's wonderful. And, and for me, you know, I think it's, it's really been, it's all, I've always been just really curious about, um, I don't know, I guess I'd, I'd frame the question as, you know, why, why is life the way it is? I mean, you know, we sort of try to understand as biologists how things work in cells, but, you know, the bigger question is, why does it work that way? And why does it work some other way, you know? And, and um, I think that's, that's for me always been kind of a driving force. And so in my career, we've worked on a number of different aspects of that question over the years. And, um, you know, and, and, and frankly, you know, some, some of the paths we've pursued have not really panned out, you know, right? I mean, they sort of hit a dead end or we sort of realized that, well, there's maybe not a lot more to be learned here given the amount of effort it would take and so we're probably better off spending our time working on a different problem and you know i think that's one of the the things really to appreciate about science is that you know you have to you know you, you, you there's lots of failures that, that that you know you encounter along the way and you can't you can't let those bog you down i always tell my students you know you have to kind of take the long view in science right you know because they're, they're going to be short-term struggles and frustrations but um, but what's important is in the longer term, are you actually getting at, you know, the, you know, some, some piece of the truth, I guess, is what we're really after with our data. Yeah, I agree completely. And Andrea, do you want to weigh in here about the importance of persistence and creativity in achieving world-class research? Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's so important, as Jennifer just um, articulated so nicely. Um, and in fact, in terms of um, our development as scientists, I think there's an interesting point um, where we transition from um, answering questions that other people have posed uh, to us. And in fact, that's, that's so much how science is taught. We do problem sets, we do our homework, there's a question, and then you have to work out the solution. And there's a known answer. You know that there's an answer. And in, in a sense, um, graduate school is all about learning how to ask the right question, 
uh, which is such a different thing because you're looking for a question that hasn't been posed before. And you're looking for a question that is both interesting to you, interesting to the community and answerable. Just because something's interesting doesn't mean you can make progress um, in it. So I often visualize, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> this process. Um, it's like we have this um, frontier of knowledge and going around and kicking um, this boundary <laughs> and trying to figure out, well, where, where is it weak? Where is our knowledge built upon um, assumptions that can be challenged? Where is there the potential for making progress? And where is it that I can, that I have the right toolbox for making progress? And I think that's a really interesting thing that we really, that, that's really all about the process of, of, of graduate work, learning how to ask those questions, learning how to position oneself, learning how to stop pursuing a question that's not working. Because in fact, these questions, they take a long, I mean, if it was easy, somebody else would have done it already. Um, so it, it's, uh, it really takes some confidence in your understanding of what is an interesting question and also willingness um, to realize that maybe that's not the right tree to bark up, and, uh, but simultaneously not giving up just because it gets hard and, or because somebody else tells you that it's a stupid idea. I can't tell you how many times somebody has told me I have a, you know, that I'm, you know, I'm wasting my time. Um, and so I think one has to develop um, um, a deep confidence in your, in what's, what's not working for you. Like your, your identity, your identify, sorry, your identification of an interesting problem. Um, and then to this point that Jennifer brought up about the importance of failure, um, it's, it is so much a part of science. And in fact, even how that we think about think about the process of doing science. It's very negatively constructed. We all poke at each other's work, you know, you, submit a paper, there's a criticism. And in fact, it's, it's such an important part of science actually. Um, we learn so much from um, mistakes, mistakes that are pointed out by others, or you, they don't, not, don't even have to be mistakes, but just different points of view. Because it's all about gaining the deeper understanding of what's going on in the universe, be it on the largest scales or the smallest scales. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I think you learn a tremendous amount from failures. You you actually, you know, it, it then helps you point, point you in the right direction oftentimes. So let's turn to another topic. And this actually is, is for Jennifer. In, in, you organized an, inter, an international symposium in 2015 at the National Academies uh, that focused on the societal and ethical use of CRISPR. And you've urged the medical and scientific community and the general public to discuss these issues. I thought it would be really good for our audience to hear about the moral and ethical issues of the research that you have been working on. Well, I guess I would start by saying that, uh, you know, when I was a student and, and training in, in biochemistry, um, you know, we had, we had a couple of cursory, uh, you know, lectures, you know, in my day on, on kind of bioethics. And then over the years I've had, you know, at various meetings, including at Howard Hughes Medical Institute meetings, we've had, um, you know, experts in bioethics come in and, and give lectures that, that have kind of highlighted how certain aspects of, of our research might have, you know, various kinds of ethical implications. But, you know, it never really hit me that my own work you know, could have those kinds of uh, really tough uh, implications until very early in, you know, shortly after we had published our work on CRISPR in 2012, when it became clear that the technology was capable of, you know, doing things, including changing the DNA and human embryos. Um, that could allow ultimately uh, changes to be made that are inherited by future generations of people. And, um, you, know, it, you know, you sort of try to imagine, you know, working away in a lab on, you know, kind of what seemed like somewhat mundane uh, projects and then realizing that, oh my gosh, you know, my work could change humanity ultimately, you know, and that it was sort of a, a really, um, you know, kind of almost like a jolt for me to kind of, you know, make that realization. 
And I had to decide, you know, do I, do I get involved in that discussion publicly? Because at the time, nobody in our government, nobody internet, you know, nobody in like international regulations or, um, you know, people outside of a pretty narrow sphere of scientific specialists were aware of the work in those very early days. So it was kind of this strange feeling of, you know, knowing something that could have profound impact on everybody, but most people don't know about it yet. And yeah. so I decided that, uh, you know, ultimately that it would be actually very, very important to be leading that conversation publicly, even though it was an area about which I knew very little, you know, in terms of sort of professional bioethics. And so I'm incredibly grateful to a large number of colleagues who have, you know, educated me and, and you know, worked with me over the years, including at the National Academies, as you mentioned, to, um, you know, really bring this topic to uh, to the fore in terms of public discussion. I think now it's at a level where the World Health Organization is involved, UNESCO is involved, uh, the national academies in, in multiple countries are, are engaged. And so it's, you know, it's really been interesting to see how over the last few years, this topic has really attracted, you know, public attention in a way that I think is appropriate given the, you know, the, um, the implications of, of the way the technology could be used in the future. And how easy it seems it, it has been applied uh, and, and the concerns about that as a result. Right? Yeah. So Andrea, you conduct your research as we've been talking about um, at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. And I thought it, we, it would be good for people to hear about the role of the Keck Observatory in your research. Well, Keck has been uh, front and central. Um, it's, I like to call the work technology-driven discovery. I think that's true in so much of this. Um, but you see, um, and Caltech co-own this telescope. But in fact, it was an innovation on the part of Jerry Nelson, um, who's, um, who was working at Berkeley uh, at the time uh, that he um, understood that there was another way to build telescope mirrors. So rather than building um, one single mirror and polishing it very carefully, there's sort of a limit uh, to how big you can make telescopes uh, mirrors that way, that you could build segmented um, mirrors. So actually Keck is not one contiguous uh, mirror. And in fact, that's the, that's the key element in a telescope is the primary mirror. Oh, I should point out, let's see which way do I go? These are the kind of <laughs> <laughs> So there are two of them. Um, and the key element is the primary mirror, which collects the light coming, uh, coming in. So the mirror is, uh, there's two of them, but each mirror is 10 meters in diameter, which is like the width of a tennis court. And that, that's enormous. I mean, there's, you have to get up close and, and, and to really appreciate how big this thing is that actually has to move very rapidly all around um, the sky to do the work effectively. So the, they're built of 36 hexagonal segments that are very carefully co-aligned. So there was a tremendous amount of controversy surrounding this. So this was a UC innovation that, um, it's just like the conversation we were just having. Like people really believe this was gonna work. Jerry Nelson um, really proved that this completely different approach to telescope design um, would work, and, and he was correct. And as a result, this telescope um, was 10 years out front, this observatory was 10 years out front of any other observatory uh, that came close to, to its size. So um, the UC community was really um, very fortunate to have the, the opportunity to um, take advantage of this shared resource. And I have to say, this is another thing I really appreciate about the University of California. It's a system-wide investment. Um, in a facility that, um, I mean, effectively, I consider this my lab. It's in Hawaii, it's not a bad place. I, I, I like to say I have to go to work. Of course, these days, um, technology has enabled us to use the telescope remotely. And in fact, this COVID has introduced yet another way. Uh, we operate the telescope from home, which is uh, uh, a new and exciting opportunity <laughs> with pluses and minuses. But it is a really phenomenal um, observatory um, that 
brings the whole UC system together in terms of the development of instrumentation. So many different campuses develop instruments that go on the back end. And in fact, the instruments on the back end of these telescopes is how you keep a facility like this young. Um, so while the telescope itself is an enormous investment of resources, um, uh, you can continue to, to, to update the instrumentation at the back end. And I like to, the analogy I like to make is the um, telescope is like your home and building the instruments at the back is like doing remodels. <laughs> you, keep it, you keep it fresh. <laughs> That's great. So I want to make sure that we have some time to have you answer at least a couple of questions from people who are watching, who submitted ahead of time some really outstanding questions. So I'd like to, to turn to some of those. And um, I, I, uh, I'll start with uh, one that I think we all uh, have experienced and, and answered, which is, um, what would be your advice for girls dreaming to be like you one day? This is this is from Kimaya Kulkarni. I hope I pronounced her name right. So Andrea, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've heard Jennifer. I'm sorry, Jennifer. I've heard you say that so many times. I mean, it's really such the it's such the truth. It's science is so much fun. Don't let anyone stop you from pursuing it. And if you have that passion, I mean, I think this is a general uh, piece of advice that we sh um, that's useful to give out. Like, follow your passions. Follow uh, because. Um, if you're interested and passionate about it, that's what's going to allow you to overcome the obstacles that will arise. I mean, obstacles come um, in our lives, both personally and professionally, but it's, it's our um, passions that drive us forward. I couldn't agree more. That's well said, Andrea. That's, 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 I think that's wonderful guidance. You know, it's uh, when I think back on all the times that uh, people uh, said, you know, were naysayers or, or, or told me something wouldn't work or I had a, a stupid idea. Uh, there were a lot of those, you know, and sometimes they were right, but, uh, <laughs> but, but sometimes they weren't, you know, and so you really have to just, you have to pursue what you think is important and worth doing and don't let anybody dissuade you from it. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Emily, if you don't mind, can I respond to something that Jennifer just pointed out? Because I think there's sort of this interesting balance that we have to achieve between the follow your passion and, and yet still listen to both what the science um, uh, the science is telling you. Um, so don't, you know, you can't be um, so driven that you don't listen. So there is a, a, a drive plus an awareness um, that one needs in order to succeed. Yeah, and I guess the one thing I would add to that is also looking for, for the right mentors. You know, I think, I think we've all benefited from having people um, there for us at times when, you know, you need, you need a, you know, you need a little support. And we all need it at times. So it's it's really important to find people, whether that's your romantic partner or whether it's uh, friends that you have or colleagues or classmates who are like minded and, and are, are going to be there for you. And you know, when you have doubts, they're, they're going to say, you know, keep going. Exactly. Or institutions, actually, because I think that's such an interesting, um, important point about you have to be in partnership. There's a lot of ways to stop good science. And in fact, the things that um, institutions can do to enable your success are remarkable and one shouldn't forget that. So um, partner well. 100% <laughs> agree. So Denise O'Kelly asks, can you speak to pivotal turning points in your thinking that have enabled your creative and intellectual breakthroughs? Jennifer? Well, uh, well, I, I'll just give one example, and that is, you know, going back to the CRISPR story. That's, I think, for us, you know, the, the, again, this was a project that started very small. It's not big science at all; small science, and as a curiosity-driven effort. And um, I guess I've always, you know, done my research where I'm, you know, I'm kind of we're, we're doing the science, but we're always kind of thinking about, you know, what are the bigger implications of this work and what is this what are the principles that you might be learning that apply to lots of systems beyond the one you might be focused on in the lab at that moment and so CRISPR had a couple of you know there were a couple of really interesting developments there one was recognizing that 
this was an adaptive immune system in bacteria, which at the time was quite extraordinary to realize that microbes had a mechanism to acquire immunity from viruses that is very different from the human immune system in detail, but in principle is kind of similar, right? So that was very interesting and kind of made me feel like, okay, this is something really worth understanding, you know, how it works so that we can compare these different kingdoms of life. How have they evolved to fight their you know, battles against viruses? And it's, you know, it seems especially relevant during the current pandemic, you know, to understand exactly. that. And then, um, and then the other, um, you know, the other moment was then understanding the molecular detail of how CRISPR worked and realizing that once we understood how to control it, that we could actually harness it to do something different from what it does in nature, which is namely, you know, using it for genome editing. Andrea? Pivotal moments, you know, they're- Pivotal turning point. Pivotal turning points. They're, they're, um, science so rarely has that moment, but they're really fun when they happen. And it, I guess the one I can think off the top of my head about is um, in that initial phase of the work where we were only looking to measure the velocities of stars. So stars moving on straight lines. This is so simple actually as a turning point, but it was so profound. It's all people were doing at the time, measuring speeds. And yet if you just take what you learn in a first year physics course and say, well, what's gonna happen next? Which is, they're gonna to start to accelerate. So that simple thing of, oh, well, let's just take this to the logical next step, not worrying what everybody else is thinking about. And, and realizing, oh, these stars in the next few years have accelerated. And in a way, and again, so simple, central forces should all uh, point to where the big mass is. We had three stars that had big accelerations. They all intersected at the same point, which to us said, oh, you're on the right path. And that's the moment we understood orbits could, um, um, could be short. And, um, and so that was, I think, the, the most exciting kind of aha moment um, that had real intellectual, <laughs> even though it's so simple, uh, behind it, oof, behind it. That's great. Well, can I, I think I just add one one quick thing I have to based on what you just said, Andre. I think I think you made a ver really interesting comment there that is very, very true in my career too. And that is that often it's the simple experiments that are the best, right? And that's important to remember. I, it's often the simple ones that, you know, in a way are, are the best that you do in your career. Thank you. That's great. So I need to bring this really fun conversation to a close. Um, I want to close by uh, quoting UCLA junior Kiana Erfanian, who said, I'm lucky to witness the excellence of women in STEM. Inspirational. I agree with Kiana, and I want to thank Professor Gez and Professor Daudna for their inspiring insights and remarkable research. If you would like to rewatch or share this conversation, it's available at ucla.edu slash connections. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you again at another Connections event.